So, I've got to try and sum up the future of food in eight minutes. I normally take at least an hour, so let's give this a go. <laughs> What's possible? Where, where might we get to? Well, the exciting thing is we're on the verge of a revolution in the food sector globally. We're standing on the precipice of dramatic change in not only how we grow food, but how we process food, how we consume food, how we distribute food. Everything, in my view, is in the going to change. And if you think about it, we've seen a lot of change in the last year. Three key trends that stand out to me. One, the emergence of protein agnostic companies. Companies that are out there saying, we don't care what we provide to our consumer, we just want to give them a great experience. We want to give them the food they want to eat. So think about Tyson. What have they done in the last 12 months? They've invested heavily in their businesses around the world to process meat and chicken and pork better. But at the same time, they've put some money into a company called Beyond Meat that makes the beef burgers that are not made of beef, but are made of plants. And they've invested into Memphis Meats, a company that's trying to create cultured meat or meat that's grown from the cells of an animal rather than growing the animal. We've got Danone. They spent over 11 billion euros buying a company called White Wave Foods, the number one position in the United States in plant-based milks. So they're not a milk company anymore. They're a beverage company, an agnostic beverage company. Or Cargill have also looked at where they invest around the world, seeking out a whole range of opportunities to diversify what they've traditionally done. Secondly, we're seeing big food go small. And what I mean by that is, no longer is the ticket on an acquisition for one of these companies a billion, two billion, three billion dollars. They're interested in buying a company that will cost them 20 billion or 20 million, but only if it's bringing some sort of innovation, some sort of change, some sort of unique factor to their, their portfolio. And they're not doing it in the mainstream, because they know if they do it in the mainstream, it will get crushed by the existing part of their business. The way they're creating these businesses is out. They've created venture capital funds, private equity funds, organizations that can go out and invest and just innovate and disrupt. So General Mills have 301 Inc. Kellogg's have, I think it's 1894, their venture capital vehicle. Campbell's are just doing everything. Rapidly worried that people will not buy tin soup any longer. But how can we disrupt that? So they're looking at really seeking out new innovation. And then the other one, health is dominating the strategic thinking of many people around the food sector. And when I say, when I talk about food now, I think you have to think about it in a much bigger picture of, of health. And there's one key reason for that. We can't afford to keep making people better. The food system as it's coming, or the health system as it's facing us today, has always been about curing people. The health system in the future will be about preventing people getting sick. And when you start to think about that, you start to see why some of these food companies are doing some different stuff. Nestle just sold their confectionery business in the United States. But if you look at what else they've done in the last 12 months, they've bought a vitamin company out of Canada. They've bought a, a natural plant-based frozen meals company out of Latin America. They've bought another uh, plant-based food company in, in the United States. They've spent a lot of money redefining their portfolio towards health, nutrition, and sustainable foods. Sugar tax on the lips of everybody around the world at the moment. And while it may or may not work, I think the jury is very much out on that, what it does indicate is governments are prepared to start to use regulation to guide people to eat what they want them to eat. And then just as a local example for me coming from New Zealand, you know, A2 Milk is now the largest company on the New Zealand Stock Exchange. Two weeks ago, it passed Elkland Airport to be valued at over 10 billion New Zealand dollars. This is a virtual company which has a proposition around type of milk and what that milk will do for people. It is now the most valuable company, far valued, more valuable than Fonterra. They don't have a single processing plant. So that, that sort of thing that interests where we're moving. So what are the questions shaping the future? For me, there's uh, six themes that I just wanted to touch on briefly. One is there's some key sustainability and social drivers that are important. Sustainability is your ticket to play. 
If you're not sustainable in the widest possible sense, and by that I mean not just the environment and water, but it's how you think about your people, how you think about their training and development, how you think about health and safety, how you interact with your community, that big wide picture of sustainability, you will not get to play in high value markets. And I think the point was made this morning, Australia has no choice but to play in high value markets whenever possible. But there's a few things you need to think about if you want to be in those markets. One is you've got to minimise your food waste. And again, we're seeing governments start to regulate down that direction. The French government, for instance, won't let a supermarket throw away edible food. It has to find a home for that food. But also, think about who your consumers are. They're increasingly millennial. They're people that want to buy your product because you have an Im making an impact, not just because you're giving them great food, not just because you want to make a profit, but the company and the consumer want to do something to make a change to a food system that leaves 825 million people around the world hungry every single night. So if you're not having an impact, you need to start to think what your impact's going to be. How are you going to transform the world? Then we've got next generation farms and the farmers that are going to operate them. The idea of a farm, you know, from my perspective coming from New Zealand being 200 hectares, that you can farm quite easily, isn't going to be the right answer. It's not going to be a big broad acre farm in Western Australia either. Farms are going to look increasingly different to match what the consumer's looking for. So we're seeing these sort of farms that you can see on the picture there, the, these aero farms, the farms that are being built inside contain or large buildings using LED lights, using high intensity hydroponic technologies. And to me, you know, they're producing local, they're producing organic and they're producing vertical, but they're producing the food that meets the needs for the consumer. And then we've got animal free farming, the evolution of cultured burgers. I had the opportunity to spend some time with Professor Mark Post, who was the person that created that first burger, the Maastricht burger. And he has a vision of feeding the world all the beef it needs from 20,000 animals, where he takes the sales out of them and he distributes that and enables people to grow their own beef in the kitchen when they want to have a steak. You know, that's quite a big step from Nespresso to your beef growing machine, but that could be coming to us. And then we've got these two what appear to be completely inconsistent food trends. We've got the alternative, the novel, some call it synthetic, but I think that's really dangerous. If the food you're viewing is synthetic, you're going to lose because a lot of these products are not. A better label for them is clean. And against that, you've got an increasing demand for craft, artisanal, ultra-raw products. How do the two come together? Well, in my mind, they do. Because Monday through Friday and Saturday and Sunday are going to be different markets. And if you think about it, people are going to want convenient, nutritious, easy to handle products for the first part of the week. When they've got the time to cook, which will probably only be at the weekend, or when they've got friends or family coming around to see them, that's when they're going to pay a premium to source those craft, artisanal, ultra-raw ultra products. And if you think 70% of the world's population is going to be living in cities, the ability to eat a fa fresh fish caught, in a, caught off the coast of Australia with all the story that sits around that is going to be something they will pay a significant premium for, particularly if you can use some of the new technology to keep that fish alive and get it into market on the same day. Then I think we've had a perception in the food industry that one size is good enough. It will work for what everybody wants. But the reality is one size will fit one in future. Personalized nutrition is going to be a big part of the way we're going to start to see our food. And Habit's a really good example of that. While there's some questions as to their, whether their DNA profile is actually ever going to be economic, it will only be a matter of time before somebody does make it economic. And you take a DNA profile of the individual and determine what it's the food they need to eat, which will keep them healthy and well and fully functional. So for me, I think what we're going to see is a move away from standard products towards very much more tailored food solutions. And printing is going to be a big part of that. The ability to print our food is becoming a reality. And I think about you know, big opportunities in areas such as food service. If you think about being able to to move from having food service where you provide one solution to a restaurant to you are providing the restaurant with a printer and some ink and the chef can do what he wants. That unlocks their ability to be creative, will completely transform that part of the industry. 
And then as Doug mentioned earlier, information and insight will dominate what the future conversation will look like. So for me, you know, blockchain is going to be a big part of that. Blockchain will mean that the individual consumer has all the information they need in their hand on their smartphone. That's a big challenge if you're owning bricks and mortar retail. I have a view that we'll go back to the future where people will buy from a greengrocer and a baker and a fishmonger and a butcher and all the different suppliers, but they won't physically go around to all those shops. They will just have them all on their smartphone and they'll just buy from the people that give them the solution they want. And just think what we can do with technology. We can put any consumer anywhere in the world in the center of any farm using virtual reality, using social media. We can have conversations with anybody. So the, the ability to connect direct to a consumer transforms what the opportunity looks like. So for me, that's a huge opportunity. And I, I can see AR becoming a big part of how we tell stories around the world. And then don't forget our lifestyles are changing. You know, we're all living faster. We're all busier than we've ever been before. So therefore, we're all going to be traveling more. How we get food into what people are going to eat when they're on the go becomes a really important part of the conversation. No longer can you assume somebody's going to take the time to sit and eat. You've got to give them the nutrition they need where they are. And think about somebody in some of those cities that Doug was talking about in China. They're going to be spending up to four hours a day, every day, on the train. Their meal times are going to be train times. So how you provide the food at the right time becomes a big opportunity. And, well, my wife looked at these slides the other day and she said, what on earth have you got in that bag? And I said, well, I'll buy you one if you want. It's a blueberry bag. But the reality is that food is fashion. And fashion changes. And as we got social media, fashion will change faster and faster than it's ever changed before. So from my perspective, if you are a wine grower and you are selling Sauvignon Blanc at the moment and you are selling it into China, the likelihood is your market's going to get disrupted because somebody will come and sell Beano Gris. And as your fashion, your, your fashion that you're gaining from will become your detriment down the track. So how you respond to that, how you change quickly, how you've got that nimbleness is going to be a big part of the future. So what is the recipe for action? Firstly, your lens from the rest, for not just for the rest of this session, but moving forward, is disruption is opportunity. You cannot afford to think about these as challenges to your business. Everything unlocks an opportunity for you to tell your story in a different way. Secondly, the consumer must be the center of your world. You absolutely cannot afford to ignore your connection to the consumer. And that is regardless of where you sit in the value chain. So whether you are the departments in, here in Canberra or around the country, you've got to understand what the consumer wants. Whether you're the producer, the farmer, the research institute, the retailer, if you're not clear on what the consumer needs, you're not going to solve their problem. And that was brought home to me when I spent some time in Ireland. And they talked about the, they send their CEOs to sleep with their customers. And what they were getting at is they're putting people into people's houses and they're living with them and they're understanding them so they can solve the problem they have. The only way we can solve a consumer problem is understanding the consumer. And then finally, you know, the important thing as I look at it is we've got to make sure that we're targeting our investment to get closer to our consumers. Historically, this has been a great industry for investing into tangible capital assets. But the reality is they give you limited competitive differential. A milk powder and dryer in Victoria is very much the same as a milk powder dryer sitting in the South Island of New Zealand or sitting in the Netherlands or sitting in the United States or anywhere. The reality is what differentiates us is what we've got up there. It's the people, the brands, the innovation and the consumer connection. And they are intangible. They're much harder to invest in, but they enable you to stand out. And as I look at it, as we look into this future, it's the people that stand out, the people that are able to be differentiated by the consumer that will be sought out and will create the value long time. So standing out drives value. Thank you.